you. Thank you. It's great, great to be here. Um, so I, I, people here may remember a science fiction writer from Britain, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. He uh, also invented the communication satellite. But one of the things he said was, people overestimate technology in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. And recently, we've heard a lot of talk about robots maybe taking away people's jobs. There was a 60-minute piece in, in uh, January about that, and there's been a lot of uh, press stories about robots taking away people's jobs. But I actually take a different view of it. I'm worried that we're not going to have enough robots to maintain for that 1 billion people, actually it's more than 1 billion people, it's the 3 or 4 billion people, maintain the lifestyles that we have and our standard of living if we don't have a lot more robots. And so I think that robots actually um, are what our society is going to be built upon in the same way that today our society is built on, the, on computation, the internet, and communications. So this idea that technology will take away jobs has been around since since the days of the printing press, but there was a great uh, movie um, called Desk Set, starring Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn back in 1957. And the theme of this movie was that computers were going to take away people's jobs. They had that mainframe computer there, uh, and it was brought, brought into this company by Spencer Tracy. Catherine Hepburn was a, a company librarian. And the librarians in this company you know, would get requests from executives uh, like, uh, what are the names of, uh, it was a marketing company, but what are the, what are the names of, of, of uh, Santa's reindeer? And they'd go and look it up and tell them what the names of, of Santa's reindeer were. This is clearly pre-Google. Um, <laughs> but the idea in this movie was this mainframe computer, and this mainframe computer of 1957, by the way, has less computing power than the, the throwaway processors in a Christmas card that can you know, play jingle bells or something. There wasn't much processing power there, but the, the idea of the movie was it's going to take away the librarian's jobs. Since it was Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, you know how the movie actually ended up. But uh, <laughs> what about in real life? Did computers take away librarians' jobs? In fact, the um, number of librarians went up and up for many, many years, even after computers were around. It wasn't really until the web and search engines came about that the requirements for those jobs changed. So it was a lot you know, it wasn't happening in 1957, it wasn't happening in 1967 or 77, it was more like 1997 that it started to have an influence. So there was an overestimate of the technology uh, in, the, in the short term, but, in the, but I don't think anyone back then could imagine that we would have Santa's reindeer names in our pockets at all time, and every other fact in the world in our pockets at all time. In fact, by the way, the, the librarians, not only the number of them went up, but they, their salaries went up higher than the average rate because the computers that were around actually worked with them. They worked with the computers, and they got more productive. So they became more valuable uh, over that period until finally the technology changed the, the nature of the work. A similar thing happened around 1980 with the, with the PC. When the PC came along, people were saying, oh, it's going to get rid of paper in the office, and it's going to get rid of uh, workers in the office. And we know it took a long time to get to a more paperless office. It's only really happening now. It didn't happen in 1980. And why is it happening now? It's happening because people like me are dying off. And a younger generation which never used paper is becoming the main people in the office. But another thing that happened, you know, this is a, this is a real spreadsheet there. That's, what, that's where the name comes from. But the spreadsheet programs were simple enough that ordinary office workers, not even accountants, could start to do accounting type things. The interface let an ordinary office worker become a programmer without having to learn Fortran or COBOL. It was an interface that an ordinary office worker could pick up fairly intuitively and do simple things rather quickly. More complex things took longer, but they could do a lot of useful stuff with the way the technology was presented to them. Because the technology of the PC respected the office worker as a cognitive agent, didn't try to just replace them as in that 1957 movie of Desk Set. Um, so uh, in our lives now, there are more and more robots around. Uh, the, on the left are, are robots from 
one of my, my previous companies, iRobot, the pack bots, which were used in uh, extensively in Afghanistan and Iraq for improvised explosive devices for roadside bombs. And so instead of sending out the 19-year-old kid in, in, a, in a, uh, a, a, a troop of soldiers to poke the bomb with a stick, they started sending out the robot. The robot blew up rather than the, the kid poking with a stick. On the right, are some robots from a company called Athon in Pittsburgh. There are hundreds of these, or they are in hundreds of hospitals uh, all over the US. There's 24 of them in Children's Hospital in Boston, for instance. The one in the front comes up from the pharmacy and brings meds up to the, up to the floor where the nurses can go and get the meds out. Uh, the one behind takes dirty sheets from the, the floor down to the laundry. So what this has done is let the nurses and nurses' aides spend less time just shoving stuff around and spend more time with patients directly. So it's increased their productivity and, and their, their, their skills are more used for what they want to use them for other, rather than, than other things. And so robots, there are more and more of them in our lives. We don't even notice it a lot of the time. They're just around. <laughs> Robots in factories, though. People have been talking about robots in factories. Are robots in factories going to take away the jobs that outsourcing to China already took away? I think maybe not. Robots in factories today, though, are much more like the mainframe of that 1957 movie. They don't respect the worker. This is a, 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 a body shop uh, assembly line in a, in a car factory. There are no people there because the robots are way too dangerous. They, they won't notice you. If they'll swing around, they'll kill you. It's not a good place to be. And to program those robots, you have to understand quaternions, six-dimensional vectors. It's a, you have to get high-priced consultants to do it. So when we see robots in automo automobile factories, where 70% of the industrial robots currently are, they're in the body shop and the paint shop, and there are no workers there. And there are no, none on the final assembly line. That's all humans and no robots. The two don't meet. The workers and the robots don't meet. So if we are going to have more robots do, you know, uh, in our factories, what, what happens to the worker? Um, so the last few years, I've been worrying about this and started this company, Rethink Robotics, and have developed this robot, Baxter. And I want to show you Baxter briefly now. Uh, Baxter is a robot that's safe to, to work with. This is in a uh, factory in Groton, Massachusetts. That's an ordinary line worker there. We did dress him up in an orange shirt to match our logo, but apart from that, that's how he <laughs> is in the factory. Uh, and he, he, he w is safe with the robot and can interact with it. And I want to show you how you pr program the robot. Here's, here's someone training the robot to do a blind pick and place, blind that's not going to use cameras. I'm just going to show you how quick it is. So she doesn't have to know about quaternions or six-dimensional vectors. She presses a, the button on the fingers, and as the fingers close, it realizes there's something there. As she presses the button on the fingers and they open, it realizes, oh, it must have been a put down over here. So now it's learnt what the task is. And it's, it's not using its camera, so it will pick up from the fixed location that she showed it. We'll get to vision in a minute. So it goes down, closes its fingers, feels that it's got it. Oh, I know it was supposed to move it over here. Moves it over there. And then it decides it doesn't quite like the kinematic arrangement she put the, rope, the arm in. It looks a little puzzled. Moves the other arm out of the way, optimizes the program itself, and now has done the task. Let's, let's go back and, and, and look at that again. I, I'm not sure how well this is coming up on the screen, but there's a map comes up on the face. The blue cross in the bottom, in the, about the bottom middle is the position of the hand she's dealing with. As she closes the fingers and it feels something between them, it nods and says, ah, there was nothing in my hand, now there's something in my hand. That must have meant she wanted me to pick it up and puts up a pickup icon. When she opens the fingers and, and it feels the force go away, it says, oh, that must be a... a, a, a Put down location, and that's the total programming to, to get the, the robot to do that very simple task. But also, the robot is aware of its surroundings, so it's safe to work into close proximity to it. Um, you shouldn't try that with a regular industrial robot, but with our robots, it's, it's quite, quite okay. Here, I'm going to show you a robot in, in, a, in a factory, uh, someone showing it some tasks. He's uh, opening and closing the fingers by pressing that button on the cuff there. And this time, he opens the fingers and it feels a force, so it realizes the pickup is by opening its fingers inside. And here on a conveyor belt, it goes in and opens its fingers to do the pickup. Um, and it's going to go, he's, he showed it where he wanted these, he wanted these, these cups packed. This is a little uh, slightly fake demo in that one arm is putting the things on the 
conveyor, the other arm's picking them off, just to, just to show you here. But notice the head moving around. The head is looking over to where the robot arm is about to move. So workers who are around the robot are never surprised by it moving randomly. It, it's sort of giving a, an authentic signal of what it's about to do, and people can feel comfortable about it. Even if it does hit them, it's okay, but they don't get hit by it because it, just like a person, a person always glances where they're about to reach. The, the robot does that. So it's very easy for people to interact. Here's, here's the robot with the left hand, which is on the right of the screen, picking up those little brown pieces. And the right hand, which is on the left of the screen, has a suction cup and is, is picking up the, uh, the white discs. Here the conveyor is going in the other direction. We, in a conventional industrial robot, you'd have to program the speed and have a brake beam and it would have to have timing. Here the robot, the, the, the uh, cameras in the robot's hand just see what's happening. You can change the direction of the conveyor as you would with a person, and a person would adapt to the situation. So it's got a little bit of intelligence, and it's able to do simple things, and simple things are easy to teach to it. The point here is that it, it respects the intelligence of the factory worker, so that ordinary factory workers with no training can use this robot, which previously would be unheard of. Um, so, uh, uh, what was I going to show you here? Ah, yes, it was dropping that, that, that thing in the box, but it, it had different fingers, different hands for different tasks. So we have to let the factory workers or, or the manufacturing engineers change the hand to be specific for particular tasks. So we've got a kit of parts for them, but a lot of our, our customers are starting to do 3D printing of fingers. But see, there's a camera right at the bottom of the cuff there that's looking down at the objects, but the fingers are in the way. And if the customers build their own fingers, how does the robot know what are fingers and what are the objects? So here we let the robot look at a background, move the fingers around, and it's seen that the yellow markings there, that's what the fingers look like when they're closed, and then the blue markings, that's what the fingers look like when they're open. So the robot is learning about you know, its own hand, you don't have to have the, an engineer teach it about what the hand looks like. It's all done uh, by the robot, in the same way that all the equations in a, in a spreadsheet were done by the PC. This is in a factory in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, packing plastic toys for export to China. That was two days after the robot arrived. So here's, here's Mildred. Mildred's in, this is in a different plastics factory. This is in Connecticut. And Mildred, uh, uh, an hour after she'd first seen the robot, she'd worked in this factory for roughly 20 years as a line worker. An hour after she'd first seen her first robot, she had programmed it to do a task. Mildred's very typical of factory workers in the US today. She's older rather than younger. And when we went out and doing our ethnography in factories and talking to factory workers, we asked, one of the questions we asked them was, do you want your children to work in a factory like you? Universal answer, no. It's sort of like people don't want to, you know, people don't want to wash by hand. They want to use washing machines. They don't want their kids doing that either. They, they don't want them working in factories. So our factory workers are getting older, a little more frail, and what these robots let them do is stay longer working in the factory and carrying out their tasks, but it's also easier, it's the, you know, getting rid of that hardcore hand washing by letting the robot do that. And so the factory workers, instead of being line workers, over time will become robot trainers. That's what's going to happen to factory workers as we make automation and robot tools as easy to use as we've made these things, the factory workers then get to use these more powerful tools. But Mildred's getting older, and that's a, that's a problem in general um, uh, in our society. Oops, here we are. Not just in Europe and the US, but also in China. Here's what's happened in the last 40 years. This is the percentage of adults who are less than retirement age. It hasn't changed much, but it's about to take a nosedive. The percentage of adults who are, who are still working age is about to drop drastically. Or if we flip that over, um, the, another way, the percentage of adults who are retired is about to go up dramatically. Uh -oh. Who's going to provide all the services for them? There's less people to do work to support uh, a large society. But also, they need some care. Now, things like robots, like the Google car. The Google car is a robot. It's a, it's a, it's a car with automation in it. will let older people drive cars safely longer. It, it, it gives them dignity and respect. But if we look at the statistics today, the caregivers for the elderly 
before our eyes are getting older. They're getting older. And so there's going to be less and less of them for the number of old people, unless everyone becomes a caregiver for the elderly. But there's just not going to be enough people around to care for the elderly. The Japanese have often talked about robots as companions for the elderly. I don't buy into that. I don't think you know, anyone wants a robot as a companion. But I think we are going to need robots to help us as we get older, because there just aren't going to be enough working age people to, to give the care to the elderly. And so in our future, we are going to be surrounded by robots, supported by robots, in a way that was, is an imaginable, unimaginable to us today. But just, as, just like telling someone 30 years ago the power of what you would carry in your pocket was unimaginable, that's how robots are going to transform our lives for the next 30 years. Thanks very much.